today's video is going to be the first in what I hope is a mini series of videos. And what I did this time around was I asked on Instagram, but um, just asked for any questions that people had that they'd quite like an answer for. Um, and then if you add any more comments you'd like in future videos to the comments of this video, if each time that happens I can kind of keep it going and answer everyone's questions. So I got some good ones from Instagram. I'm going to be throwing large and medium swirly tumblers and mugs. Um, so I'll do that while answering the questions. There's a few kind of very quick ones, a few that are huge questions and some that overlap. So hopefully this will go relatively easily. First one's a big one. Well, sort of a big one. It's how did I grow my following? And this will be on Instagram rather than on here. Although the same sort of thing applies to both. And the answer is slowly um, and by being consistent. And I've said on here before about how I reckon it took um, a year to get to the first thousand followers on Instagram. And then I can't remember the number now, but it was something like 50,000 at the end of the next year. So it really takes a while to, firstly, I'm constantly trying to improve the quality of pictures and videos and, and the quality of the work. So to a certain extent, you'd expect the first thousand to be harder because you're not going to be as good a potter during that time. But also the algorithm judges you based on how other people respond. So the more followers you've got, the more worthwhile the algorithm is going to think you are. But really that doesn't help you when you're starting out. Um, you just want to be consistently as good as possible and so you want to be working on improving the quality of your content and you want to be of use to your audience so if you can provide people with a reason to follow you and a reason to keep coming back uh, and do that repeatedly consistently over a long time period well i say long longish um, that first year is a bit of a slog, but then after that, when you're kind of growing by a few hundred or a thousand followers a month, you're, you're kind of then you're snowballing, but also it doesn't take too many people who want your work uh, for it to actually be a viable source of income. So, yeah, there's... Um, there's probably a better video. I, I did the one on starting out, which will answer it a bit better, I think. So I'll post a link to that. And I'll post all the questions uh, in the video description so you can see with the timestamps. That's the plan, at least. I think a lot of the time I say stuff like this while I'm recording and then forget to do it when I post the video, but I'll try and remember. Okay, so next question. Um, why do you pack your kiln so sparingly? Now, this might not mean so much on YouTube, but uh, if you follow me on Instagram, I post kiln before and afters. And there's another question about them in a minute. Um, and so people get to see the inside of my kiln, which is packed quite sparingly. And the reason is very simple. Uh, my kiln isn't massively powerful, is quite old, and simply put, um, any, if you're getting, no, so basically the firing schedule is only part of the equation when it comes to how pieces will behave. So you've got your glazes, you've got your firing schedule, and then just as importantly is how you pack the kiln. And you want to consistently pack the kiln one way or another um, just because if you want consistent results, having a densely packed kiln or a loosely packed kiln will change how 
um, the glazes behave, especially if you've got glazes that will crystallize. Uh, so kind of crystalline, semi-crystalline or ones that are on the borderline of matte, things like that. If your kiln is densely packed, you'll have a lot more heat trapped that will kind of bounce around between the work. The, the work will cool down, especially the work in the middle, will cool down slowly compared to a loosely packed kiln. Neither's right per se, but if you want to have consistent results, you need to pack similarly each way. And then the other part of the equation for me is that it costs me, well, so a glaze firing is 30 kilowatt hours. No, 25 kilowatt hours. And electricity round here is somewhere between about 12 and 15p per kilowatt hour. So it costs a few pounds to fire an entire kiln up to cone six. Um, I have limited space in the studio and it's more convenient for me to fire more frequently and get the work through than it is to let the work build up and fire slightly more efficiently. So I have a surface that I pile the work on while I'm glazing and that equates quite neatly to a loosely packed 60 litre kiln. Um, I would need to either put more work on the tables, which is less comfortable when you're trying to move around freshly glazed work and you know, a tendency to knock things with other things. Um, so I could do it, but it's just quite convenient with my studio setup to knock and fire more frequently and it's slightly less energy efficient but not hugely because obviously if you pack a kiln more densely you're, you're heating up the kiln once but the amount of energy required to get a piece of work up to cone six and back is the same for that piece regardless of how many other pieces are there. It's called specific heat capacity um, and it's just literally how much energy does it take to heat a thing up by an amount and that's independent of everything else. So if you pack your kiln absolutely solidly, assuming you could even get it to cone six, which again comes back to the old and not massively powerful kiln, I think mine would struggle to, probably not cone six, but anything above that would definitely struggle if the kiln was too tightly packed, just because there's more mass um, to heat, so it's got to put more energy in and at the higher temperatures it's losing a lot of energy just through radiation and convection and you know it's naturally cooling down it gets less and less capable of adding more heat as it gets hotter and then the more work you've got in there the more it's going to struggle so yeah convenient and consistent that's why i do it uh, next question uh, why don't i ever show my face or um, well actually yes, it's just, why don't I? Which is quite simple, I never liked being the centre of attention when I started this. I, it was more comfortable for it to all be about the work and the content rather than about me. And that remains true. I understand that you, you form a relationship with people because I do it with other people whose content I consume where you watch them and you kind of feel like you get to know them a bit and it is a bit weird in some respects that I'm present in my videos but not at the forefront but um, that is the sort of person I am so that's what's comfortable for me and I don't think it's a hindrance if you're not relying on your personality, or not relying is a bad choice of word, but some people are naturally charismatic and put themselves at the forefront and that works really well because they're the sort of person who does well at the forefront of things. Whereas I would not, I've got these 
low energy, just me droning on videos. Seeing my face would not improve these at all. Um, and so, yeah, I don't feel particularly compelled to. I understand it is, I think some people would prefer it. Just because, yeah, you kind of, you get to know someone a bit, but, um, but anyway, that's why. And I might change my mind about it. I've kind of, it's always hard to know where anything's gonna go. I didn't think I'd talk on camera and actually once I started doing it, it's far more convenient than typing and I quite like just waffling on, which is partly why I wanna do these questions and answers because it's fun having other people's things makes you kind of think of something new. Um, what advice would you give to an aspiring ceramicist? Well, the, again, this is that video that I mentioned a minute ago would be quite convenient for this one too. Um, the biggest advice I would give is that first year to grow a thousand or so followers, or you know, kind of if you pencil that in to your schedule and don't assume that you can become insta famous immediately, um, do that as soon as you possibly can. If you're a student or if you're a hobbyist, uh, get a professional and you don't have to spend any money on it but have it as only pottery and post the best pottery content you can under a name that you would be happy continuing to use as a professional potter and start doing that immediately because to start with you're going to be talking to no one in particular there'll be a handful of people that will find you um, and by the time you've got the huge following you'll be or rather by the time you're ready to start selling um, or doing it full-time you'll be in a much better position if you wait until if you're doing it as a, a course if you wait until you finish the course if you're doing it as a hobbyist if you wait until you're at a standard where you think that you could sell your work for a premium price and then you try and grow the following you're still going to have a time period over which you don't have a huge following so get going as soon as you can and really think about the quality of your videos and pictures uh, again i think i talk about this more in that video but if i don't i've got a blog post where i talk about my light setup um, and i'm using the same lights for this they're led panels they give a nice diffused light and they're 20 quid each. So you can set yourself up a nice diffused photo area and get professional looking photos for about 50 quid, which is not nothing, but it's not prohibitive. It's not spending 300 pounds on a full photo studio setup, or even that wouldn't be a full one, but I'm, you know what I mean? Like it's much easier to justify that. Um, yep, yeah, back to the, so how do you take such perfectly lined up photos of your before and after kiln firings? Very easy one. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, check out my Instagram with the saved stories. If you go on my profile, there'll be before and afters. Probably won't be the most recent ones because you can only put 100 pictures in and I keep forgetting to replace the old pictures with the new pictures. But uh, it basically is just top down pictures because I've got a top loader of my kiln showing um, the work before and after. So firstly, you've got to get in the habit of taking the pictures as you load each shelf in the kiln, which thankfully I am in. Um, so I always get the pictures. Sometimes I forget to post them, but I always take them. And then the lining up is really easy in Instagram stories. If you wanted to do this any other way, you'd have to I open Photoshop and put the two as layers so you can toggle back and forth. But with Instagram stories, you can do multiple images at once. And if you do multiple images, you can jump forward and backwards between them. So it's very easy to just keep, keep tweaking the alignment until they align vertically. The new Android camera app, if you turn on guides, I think they call it, or they, some something in the settings kind of useful guides that gives you 
um, vertical. So it gives you a lovely crosshair. If you hold your phone looking straight down-ish, it gives you the center of your camera crosshair and vertical center crosshair. And when the two are aligned, you're pointing straight down, which does make it a little bit easier. Although, in the same update, they've made it so that my camera crashes about half the time. I ask it to take a picture, so swings and roundabouts. But I'm sure other camera apps will have a similar thing. But yeah, basically, if you're doing it in Instagram stories, it, it makes it surprisingly easy. Glazed tips for a new home potters with a smallish budget, not new to ceramics. So really, glazed tips are the same regardless of um, the size of your studio. In a lot of ways, the glazed tips I would give for small studios is that you don't need to have big glaze buckets and mix up. Some people mix up 10 kilos of a glaze at a time. The most I've ever mixed is probably three kilos, possibly three or four. I've got some slightly bigger tubs that will take four kilos but most of the, the tubs I use are five liters. They take three kilos of glaze mix and you actually only need to mix up one kilo if you have the correct shaped pots. So what I would do is I'd suggest finding rectangular, like varying circular pots because then you can dip tumblers and travel mugs and round things and bowls and what have you. And it's as long as the, the piece is a similar um, size, like slightly smaller than diameter of the pot. What happens is you displace a lot of glaze so it comes up. Um, now I talked about this in one of my glaze videos, but it might be a bit buried to find it. But um, yeah, basically find a pot that's only slightly bigger than the thing, then you don't need much glaze to dip a whole piece in. Um, and Mugs are slightly harder because you've got to have something to accommodate the handle, but if you get a rectangular pot, I've got a few of them of different sizes, then you can dip mugs with less glaze. So that's a very good way to avoid having too much or having loads of glaze in the studio. Um, other than that, it's just making good use of your space so you can um, let things dry overnight and oh, it's a glaze tips with a smallish budget. Well, the same thing applies, really. I was thinking smallish studio. Smallish budget is the same. Just don't try and make glazes with really expensive materials. But um, the simple fact is that you most glazes are similarly expensive unless you're doing ones with um, a ton of cobalt in. And just as an aside, everyone should check out um, Cone Infinity it's TC on Instagram. He works a lot with Matt at Ceramic Materials Workshop at doing kind of just glaze tests. And one of his glazes is fluxed. The alkaline earth is cobalt. So where you would normally have kind of 1% cobalt will give you a fairly nice blue. Uh, TC is doing crystalline glazes that have 20, 30% cobalt, which is just stupidly expensive, but produces these amazing blue and purple crystalline glazes that um, almost justify the price. I think if I was a crystalline potter, I'd give his recipes a go, but uh, a bit too pricey. And now, make things even more ridiculous he's trying the same with uh, rare earths which are even more expensive than cobalt but um, yeah the, it doesn't really if you're mixing your own glazes you can't do too much you can look at um, the chemistry and some ingredients are more expensive than others but I initially, when I was starting out, I made a spreadsheet uh, of all the glaze recipes I had with the cost of each ingredient and actually Glazy is going to do a similar thing where you can tell it how much each ingredient costs and it will give you the price of each recipe. Um, and there is a lot of variation, but realistically, glazes tend to come pretty much back round, good glazes come back round to costing about the same. 
because there isn't a huge amount of difference in cost per mole of boron or cost per mole of anything really what you'll find is that a lot of the cheap recipes are cheap because they don't use boron so you can have a cheap cone 6 recipe using a bristol reaction so it doesn't have boron which is normally the expensive thing um, so if you look at blaze ingredients you'll see fritz and gertzli bora are the ex generally the more expensive ones or something like lithium carb um, most other glaze ingredients are quite cheap but to bring a glaze down to cone 6 correctly you need to put boron in or you need to do a bristol reaction which uh, works by adding zinc or you can do a similar thing with iron so there are ways of having cheap glazes but they limit um, what you can do with the glaze so you're better off just finding glazes you like and making them even though they might be slightly more expensive than ones that don't get down to temperature with the same mechanism but not all cheap glazes have uh, done their chemistry well so you can make a cheap glaze by just not including the boron and then calling it a mat and what it is it's actually under fired um, so don't go too much on cost unless you're also looking at the chemistry um, when you first started what did you struggle with the most and how did you overcome it when I first started throwing it was definitely centering and just through hours of frustrating repetition uh, when I started on Instagram I suppose it was that first thousand followers and that's just time and the other thing that I struggled, well struggled's not quite the right word but was reluctant to do was um, speak on camera and show my face and going back around to that third question and there's a certain element of I got I overcame it by just avoiding it uh, but also that I kind of did it in small controlled amounts on my own platforms so I haven't done any podcasts I haven't done any kind of guest video appearances on anyone else's feeds and part of that is because this way I control how I edit and whether or not I publish things and I don't think I would really care if I went on a podcast and you know I, I hadn't explained something perfectly I, I don't think that would really bother me that much but at the same time it's reassuring to know that that I can make the final decision so it's not a particularly good answer but yeah in certain cases it's just avoiding things um, someone asked how did the kintsugi turn out I'm not sure if that's how you say it because I've only ever seen it written down uh, but that's just I broke or I didn't break a mug Reuben broke a mug and we stuck it back together and it worked fine um, it definitely wasn't the neatest you need to give it a go a few times I think to do it well it was okay but it's actually I, I wasn't sure it was going to look good because it was just literally the gold powder I got a cheap one on Amazon I think or it's from somewhere I got a cheap fairly cheap little thing of gold powder and two part epoxy glue and just mix them up put them on the crack squidge it and so it pokes out the side uh, and it actually it looks okay um, yeah I think I could do it better after a few attempts it definitely wasn't great but uh, when he next breaks something I will do the same again uh, is there an unusual glaze technique slash outcome you've never tried and want to well I, ha I would love to try proper crystalline stuff and I haven't because the 
firings are tough on the kiln and you can't fire any other work at the same time and I would love to, not that this is a unusual one but I'd love to try reduction and at some point I will get around to getting uh, a gas kiln so I can give it a proper go um, and then the other unusual glaze technique I've not tried but would like to is the really thick uh, gloopy glazes so on glazy fairly recently Derek was looking at gloopy glazes and did a kind of blend to see what level of silica and alumina gave what result as gloopy but the, I'm talking about the ones that look like they're mid drip but well what I'll do is I'll find a picture of it and overlay it now because there are some really fantastic, you can get some amazing results with it and it looks fascinating not practical in any way but for sculptures um, it looks like a lot of fun and there's no reason why I couldn't do it I just haven't yet and I would also, not that this is something obviously that I have tried but I'd like to do the snowflake crackle on a bigger pot I tried to solve that to make the glaze more workable and never quite got it got it so that it was working well on flat surfaces as a more sensible glaze recipe but um, in doing so lost some of its stiffness so whereas before it would mostly stay put on a vertical surface uh, my revised one just all flowed to the bottom and would snowflake where it pulled but the sides would just be a regular glaze so it's another one I would like to come back to at some point um, someone asks I'm wanting to get into throwing what features on a wheel should I look out for well in my opinion big splash pan I love the splash pan on this scut it was the main reason I bought this over any of the other ones that it looked equally good and I genuinely think I will be less happy with any of the other major wheel brands just because the splash pan wouldn't be as good uh, other than that you know this is half horsepower which is powerful enough for me sometimes I can feel it slowing down slightly and I guess maybe a one horsepower um, wouldn't but yeah there are all the all the major manufacturers all their kind of top end wheels are half horsepower or more and I think that'd be plenty for most so you're just looking within your budget um, and then the, the one thing that separates them for me is the splash pan so in my opinion go for a scut uh, the solid body one is really nice but they do a plastic tray uh, in this size as well so either of those should be good and I have no complaints about this wheel uh, it does absolutely everything I ask it to and does it well so yeah I'll go and buy another one of these if anything happened to it um, and they do ones on a, a range of prices but just do your research and see you know if you if you don't have any specific criteria then it should be quite easy to find a good wheel um, how do I know my different glazes will react to each other and on different clays testing test all your glazes over all your other glazes I've done at least thousands of test tiles if not multiple thousands of test tiles at this point um, on different clays with different slips and after a while you sort of get a feeling for it but there's no substitute for doing an actual test tile so if in doubt just have a, a big tub of them preferably in several different clays and overlap them underlap them combine them in different ways you know any of that sort of stuff um, I know because I've tested and while I there are ones where I 
would assume that I knew how it was going to work. I would still test before I put it on a piece. I do have sacrificial pieces that, um, you know, if I throw in pieces, it's okay, but not good enough to sell. What I do is I set it aside, and when I'm at the point of testing a glaze at full scale, but don't quite want to put it on a piece that could otherwise be sold, I'll test it on one of them. But I will almost certainly have done a test tile before that point. Um, did I use commercial glazes before making my own, and how long did it take to learn? Yes, and depends what you mean by learn. Um, I was making viable glazes from John Britt's book within a week or two, well, I mean basically as soon as starting, because the thing with mixing glazes is that it is really simple. If you can follow a recipe, then you can mix your own glazes. The trick is to buy the ingredients, um, which yeah, there's a definitely an upfront cost there, but um, yeah, making glazes is not at all tricky. Finding glazes that work well for you, especially if you're just testing glazes at random, that does take a while. So I would say I kind of had a fairly good idea what my glazes were doing, or how my glazes would behave. Um, within a year of starting to mix my own glazes because I've tested a lot of things by then and I don't think I could honestly claim to have had much idea of what chemically was going on in my glazes until I took a ceramic materials workshop class uh, and then depending on which class you take if you take the full understanding glazes class that's 12 weeks and by the end of that as long as you're capable of um, watching all the videos because there is quite a lot of content and I know some people take it and then life gets in the way a bit um, I was quite it was timed very conveniently for me in that I took that class when Rubes had just been born or yeah I think he was born kind of like a week into it so what that meant was that um, I had big blocks of time where I was pinned under a sleeping baby and I could just watch the lectures on a tablet. Um, and I know other people who have tried to do the, run the course at this time of year and there's just no way. You know, I have, if I was doing the course now, I would be watching the videos at kind of 10 o'clock at night or something like that. I, you need, you need to have the time to to pay attention to them, which does make it a little bit trickier. But um, they will teach you everything, or give you a very good grounding in glazes. Obviously, there's there's always more to learn, but um, from a chemical and um, theoretical point of view, you can then start to see exactly what's going on with all of your glazes and why. So that will be what I would suggest as a way to learn. Um, yeah, if you wanna learn about glazes. Biggest piece I've thrown, um, basically as big as my kiln in both directions. So I've thrown a bowl that was 40 centimeters across and had to chop the edge off slightly so it would fit in widthwise. And the other day I threw a three segment thing that was as tall as the kiln, um, which again is about 40 centimetres I think. So not massive, but I can't fire anything bigger than that. Uh, any questions that I'm tired of answering? It's a very good question. I don't mind pottery questions. I mean, the repetitive ones. I don't like it when people... Well, actually, the answer to this question is things that I've already answered and made as readily available as possible. So I get asked under videos things that I have explained in the video and they're explained in the notes or the, the caption for the video and then provided links to pages where I explain further and then people won't 
watch, listen, or read any of that and ask the same question again. And that's probably the only thing I'm tired of answering, or I generally just don't bother now, because it's such a waste of time. If, if, the answer, if I've already answered the question, and the answer's there, then I'm more than happy to answer anything I haven't answered, because I know there'll be someone else who finds the answer useful. And people do kind of, I've done it plenty of times, you read someone else's question and think, that's a good question, and then the answer and think, I've learned something. So even if no one else has asked it, and no one comments to say, you know, thanks for answering, generally speaking, if you're answering a good question in the comments, I like to think that at least a few other people will benefit from it at the same time. But if it's something where everyone who is prepared to read or pay attention has already got the answer, then you're not actually helping anyone else out by just repeating the same thing. So that's the only thing I'm tired of answering. Actual good pottery questions, I'm more than happy to. Um, advice on glazing black clay. Well, this is uh, a dark clay. This is the anthracite I'm throwing at the moment. And really, my answer to that is find a good black clay, because I have used four or five, and this is the only one I've ever bought a second bag of because the others are all rubbish. They can throw nicely, they can look quite good on small pieces, but um, they almost never work with glazes. So, um, the answer to that is to find a clay that does work, rather than try and come up with a way of getting the glazes to work, because I genuinely don't think you will. Or at least on some clays you won't. Some clays it might be you need to tweak your process, but um, no, in my experience, and this clay does sort of confirm it for me. Um, if you've got a bunch of other clays that are all working, and then one clay that doesn't, just blame the clay. If you've got something that doesn't work on any clay, you can then start looking for other solutions, but. Um, unless there's a particular reason why you're you're working with one clay in particular, um, yeah, giving up on a clay and changing it is not a bad thing. Um, oh, actually, so there's. A couple of quick questions there, and then one really good question that almost deserves its own video. So I'll just rattle through them quickly so that they're all finished um, in this one video rather than having one or two left over. So, um, best clay for beginner in throwing and for hand building? No, I don't, I don't have a preference. I would have said KGM, but obviously that's caused me a load of grief recently. But whatever's cheap and slightly grogged and works at your temperature and is local. So, yeah, that answer's going to vary depending on where you are, what temperature you're firing to, and so on. So just, yeah, no no clear answer for that. How do you take care of your hands? Um, not as well as I should, but I have moisturisers absolutely everywhere because the clay will dry your hands out. Obviously, they're wet at the moment, but the second I've got the clay off, the the skin will just start to dry and crack if I'm not careful. <clears throat> so I just moisturise them whenever I remember and if I don't remember and leave it for too long I will know about it. Um, so I have, there's a, it's healed now, but that one day I forgot and then my hands dried out and then when I extended my fingers the skin just split across there, which is a very annoying place to have uh, an open wound. So yeah, just keep moisturising them. Um, how do you trim a piece that isn't round at the top like a jug? I find it so hard to centre. Well it is, so I don't make them. 
<laughs> uh, the, the GIF and GRIP makes it slightly easier because you can add the, um, the extending bit so you grip it higher up and also there's, they've made green sliders now that can slide independently but um, yeah you make yourself a chuck uh, but I don't do it often because it is a real pain. Uh, Favourite way to wedge clay, I don't like any of them but I do spiral wedging and I'm not amazing at it so I'm not going to talk at length, there are plenty of good videos by people who are better at it than me um, but they're all a faff and they're all too much work so at some point I'll get a pug mill or an inter. Um, and then the, the question that basically needs its own video is glaze safety. How do you test and make sure your glazes are food safe? And the answer to that really is take a ceramic materials workshop class so you understand what makes a glaze reliable and well melted and within sensible levels for things. Um, Matt covers all of that and then um, also also explains that the rate at which your body can process something. So people talk about uh, copper toxicity and how you know, copper could leach from your glazes and be absorbed by the body but the body can then process it and even with a really badly formulated, really badly, so the copper is literally just falling out of the glaze into the water, um, depending on which numbers, whether you're looking at the CDC or, you know, I can't remember the, the exact breakdown that he gives, but he looks at um, different kind of to copper toxicity level numbers and how the body can process them and water toxicity so if anyone's ever heard the stories of the people who you know you, there was one a little while ago where they were having a see if you can down a massive jug of water and then not go to the toilet competition and if you're drinking water on that sort of scale water is toxic so there is a toxic, toxic level of water. If you consume too much at once, it um, affects your body ability. Or it affects the ionic balance. It kind of your sodium levels, which work as transmitters. Um, you. It's why when uh, you get sports drinks they're isotonic they've got uh, electrolytes in them because if you drink too much water with nothing to, to balance that out you dilute um, things and your body starts to malfunction when the levels get too far from what it's comfortable with and that is water toxicity and so water can kill you if you drink too much of it at once um, and the point of all of that is that in a lot of cases even if you were drinking from a cup, exclusively from a cup that um, was glazed with a terrible copper glaze with 10% copper and that was just dropping the copper out into the water and you were drinking the copper, even at the rate that the worst glaze leaches copper, you'd die from the water before you died of the copper. So it's one of those things where um, the important thing with glaze safety, um, maybe I will do this as a full video, or maybe I'll just leave it as, it's, it's an issue where it's up to each individual what level of risk you're prepared to take. Because at the end of the day, the easiest way to not have this problem is to not use any colorants in a surface that's going to come into contact with food and arguably not use any colorants at all which you wouldn't be having the conversation if people actually wanted to do that and the reason people don't want to do that is because that would mean that you're not using any colorants um, very easy to make a glaze that's safe by only using ing ingredients that are safe and relying on the fact that 
the glaze won't leach them, but if it did, it wouldn't be a problem. From a, a legal point of view, the only things you actually have to worry about are lead and cadmium, which pretty much no glazes use for that reason. Um, so all glazes are food safe, legally. Um, and then it's your tolerance for ambiguity. And if you don't have the tolerance for ambiguity, then don't use colorants in any surface that's going to come into contact with food. If you want to be reassured, take the ceramic materials workshop class and learn about glaze chemistry so that you know how a glaze is behaving and whether or not it's doing what it should or is a badly formulated glaze that won't do what it should and isn't correctly melted and might leach ingredients. Um, but yeah, there's no definitive answer beyond the legal one and that doesn't satisfy most people because that as an answer is just don't worry about it. It doesn't actually matter. But that's how you can get away with having as many varied answers as you get because because everyone's saying, you know, this this is safe, this if they haven't put lead and cadmium in it, you know, they're fine because legally it is considered food safe. Um, but yeah, possibly not a discussion that any potter really wants to engage with. I know Matt won't thank me for telling you to go and have one of his courses or he'll thank you, thank me for sending you to the courses, but won't thank me if you then start arguing with him about it because it's something that he will refuse to back anyone up on because it's just not worth getting in arguments with people on the internet about glaze food safety because there's no right answer. So up to you, really. So yeah, anyway, um, if you have any questions that you've thought of, any follow-up questions to anything I've said or any new questions, comment below. I'll do another video in a few days, in a week or so, uh, and answer them if there's enough questions. And if there isn't, then I clearly answered everything, so that's great.